Where I want to start with you guys is uh, now I read that um, when you discovered of each other that you made music, you, you used to drive up to shows and festivals together before you were making really music together. What were those trips like? Uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of fun. We were younger, um, um, pretty debauchery. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of drinking involved, if we're honest. Um, not on the way up, though. <laughs> no, not on the way up. No. When we got there. It was just, animals. It was party time for us. We were younger. Uh, we had yeah. you know, a big crew of friends with us all the time. Okay. We had to get them tickets to come along. Mm -hmm. um, we'd stay for the whole weekend at festivals, you know. Those yeah. Things, like now when we've got a festival, we're in and out in a few hours normally. I can't wait. Yeah. Some of those festivals, I, I slept on the stage. I was that drunk. Did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and especially when you're younger and it's kind of, I, I don't know how, exactly how old you were, but musically speaking, it was formative years, I suppose, for you guys. So, so um, what, how do you look back at the music and that kind of the creativity that, that kind of got, got ignited there? Well, we were trying to just um, <clears throat> move away from the, the modern sound of the DJs are playing because it's just getting a bit wobbly. And we're going back to the music that we grew up with that made us really get into it. So it's kind of the boom bap of uh, the mid 90s golden era, some of the classier side of big beat and the more DJ orientated breakbeat records. We thought kind of readdress that sound and go back to the kind of raw organic drums and make everything sound a bit more natural. So just kind of... Yeah, that was the, the main impetus there that was reigniting our interest in that kind of scene and going back and dealing with all the breaks and samples and trying to and get your head under the hood of how people used to make music back then so we could respect it more and try and do our own flip on it. And well, I what, think like we are, you know, our records now are, they come from a place of being DJs still. Mm. And that was sort of, that was founded in that, you know, in those party sets that we used to play. So, you know, our albums are designed to get up and make you dance. They're not, you know, right. nothing else really. <laughs> There's a few few chilled moments occasionally, but yeah, you got to catch serve buzz. a purpose really. Yeah, yeah. You want to get people to move. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And so yeah, it comes from that place of being a DJ, I think. Mm. And but with what you just mentioned, uh, I, I find that interesting because um, when you delved into music from, from back in the day, uh, from previous decades, and especially from a producer slash DJ standpoint where you kind of dissect the music, what did you notice about how music was made back then? A lot of good ideas mm -hmm. rather than a lot of good instruments and a, lot, a really good record collection. Someone like Fatboy Slim, for instance, who was in various bands and group through the yeah, probably 60s and 70s. And you can see the kind of uh, pop sensibilities he was he was dragging from and the kind of uh, monkey's era, psychedelic pop, power pop music he was trying to put through the, the, the food processor of his sampler. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely getting under the hood of those type of people, really. Right. And what, what it's, it's always difficult when you're uh, making music, I suppose. But are you looking for something in uh, particular to make or is it kind of uh, more of a trial and error type thing? Uh, well, it, I think it's about finding, for us, it's about finding a certain sample that jumps out to us, and that's always the starting point, really. Um, and then if we like that, then we build upon that with, you know, throwing extra stuff into it. It all becomes a bit of a mashup of stuff. But yeah, a, gro a groove and a feeling and a, a certain energy and something that, that pricks both of our ears. I mean, sometimes Roy will send me something and be like, is this any good? I, I like it. And I'll be like, no. But if we both really like it, then we, then we know like there's something there, yeah. Mm. A lot of impulses come from hearing a piece of music, be it old okay. or new, and just being inspired by it sonically and feeling like, damn, what, what tip are they on? What plateau have they reached to make, make them consider this? That's amazing. Mm. Maybe sit down, analyse it, and try and do your own version of it. Take away the pit parts that are, uh, <clears throat> are ripping it off and try and put your own angle on it, maybe, and see if you can come up with something fresh. But always, be, always been inspired by new and old music, really. That's, that's interesting as well, because I was, and then this... this it might be misgiving, but um, when I think of musicians, I always think that they don't really have the time to explore other people's music uh, as, as much uh, as they used to. So, so, but for you guys, um, so I, I can assume you're very much still music fans and you go on the lookout for anything new and interesting that you hear. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm always listening to music. It's, it's always on. Oh, no, I very rarely listen to my own music or stuff okay. like that, really. So uh, that would, yeah, that would be weird, I think. Um, I think I've probably <laughs> listened through our album 
like three times okay. and then I'm like, yeah that's that's enough <laughs> don't yeah, hear it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe i've listened to it less actually as well it's almost like it's done and it's i might revisit it in 10 years and then with massively fresh ears and go oh that's what i was trying to do because <laughs> now yeah. you just you're too close to the woods a little bit to see the trees. And, well, yeah. well, with with that in mind, let, let's look at the first record because that, that that's the biggest gap of time, so to say. So as we do our thing, um, when you I, I don't know when you last listened to it, but what what do you hear? It's basically a collection of um, EPs, really, and it was sketches of ideas, very much based on not knowing any vocalists or musicians and having to rely on your own chops chopping up other people's records really so mm. you can hear that sound and that's something i think in the future we're going to be revisiting even more okay. but yeah more legally yeah they were all they were all singles you know they were all made to be singles and and dance floor mm. sort of bombs and i think that's that's how we came to realize what sorry there was a fly <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how we came to real i guess that was the foundation of and our you know the rest of our albums have gone on to feel a bit like a bunch of singles as well, I think. Like, yeah. With that first album, we approached it piecemeal, like I say, on an EP basis. So you could have, I don't know, four, eight, 16, 20. I don't know how many songs were in those EPs. Cut the weak bits, the filler, and then just have a very strong body of work. And also something that was built up over time, whereas now you approach an album, like make an album. Starts here, ends there. That's the block of time before. Yeah. Even though we we're going to put an album out, so just like cavalier attitude to find it samples. It wasn't even things. it wasn't even our idea, was it, to put an album out? It was something that okay. Trevor at Jalapeno Records said. I think you've got enough songs here. If we stitch them all together, take your back catalogue. I think we've got enough to make an album. And we're like, really? Huh. I never saw it like that. And okay. And then <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, people people kind of loved it. Yeah. That's right. Some of the strongest and most, I suppose it's because they've been out the longest, but some of our more popular things are off that first album. And of mm, course, definitely. outside of the original EPs, the next step when we had an album idea for As We Do Our Thing was to find a good rapper. And that was Andy Cooper. And he got involved right. for two songs on there that got clipped on the end and made that album, which is Rock Rock and Blast Off, which is still like set favourites of ours. Mm. Yeah, and then, and then uh, all the way up to now, you're still uh, working with Andy, and it's going really well, uh, as far as I can tell. So le let's jump into the first uh, song on Say the Word, and hit me one time, um, where Andy is on as well. So, so, and it's a, I suppose it's a song about the music industry, right? It is, yeah. He's, he's definitely saying there's a certain element of prostitution that can happen there, mm -hmm. and that's some of the imagery and lyrics he's bringing into the fall. Um, he had a wicked idea for a video where there'd be rappers in like uh, prostitute windows, you know, <laughs> and we'd like Amsterdam. Right. And they'd be, they'd be walking down there and um, there'd be various people looking from different areas of hip hop, I think, selling themselves. So, and that was just something strong to kick off the album with because it had an intro for a start mm. with the spoken word bits from an old funk record. And it was so tough because we're known for quite a light, fluffy sound. It was just nice to kick off the album like, oh damn, they've changed up a little bit. Mm. And Andy came raw with that. I think it's the closest we've got to an absolute banger of a hip hop track, I think. And especially with a track like that, how does that start, so to say? Is, is it just one of you coming up with the the initial initial beat and then adding things onto it? Yeah, it's, uh, Roy's the sample guru and the guy with lots of patience, so he's, he'll uh, sift through hundreds of files and find something that it's got a certain character to it, and then it gets branched out to to us and to you know, to listen to work on the arrangement. Andy will get involved, start laying down his vocals, and maybe sometimes some other instrumentation. I think that mm. I think that track is very sample, isn't it? It's, it's mainly the sample, it's but there are other works on that he really gets stuck into and starts laying down, you know, chords and stuff as well. So, yeah, it just kind of grows from this first idea of the sample, really. And in terms of making uh, a hip hop track in that in that sense, because of what it reminded me of is, and I have limited knowledge about music, but uh, it reminded me a little bit of Jurassic Five and that kind of feel of that era of hip hop. So is that that era kind of for you the the golden age, so to say, or do you take inspiration from any? You can take inspiration from this era as well. Well, it's interesting that they they came out with a golden age 
that was referencing a golden age so right. it was a degree of separation there it's right. quite meta and we've always been quite revisionist retroactive and throwbacky so for them to come out especially with an ironic name like jurassic five <laughs> sure. from an old school period they were definitely uh, an inspiration because around the time they were coming out early 2000s hip-hop had got very jiggy very clubby you know there was still mm. a lot of underground new lps and um <clears throat> taylor end of tail end of the Vorka stuff but it was kind of like a fluffy sound that was a bit too much for us so when they came out with the original breaks and samples again and uh, you know the, the the pillars of hip-hop it was nice to go back and see people who are still uh, flying that flag and holding that torch out because that's also what I find fascinating about music and, and especially I suppose the last couple of years or maybe even decade but the, the, this interest in this public interest in in retro or in in kind of uh, looking back at the, at the past a little bit and looking i don't know if it's a form of nostalgia but or, but, but there is some some love for it yeah can you have well. an ex explanation for it why that happens it's a 20 year cycle based on the moon <laughs> there is some kind of lunar nutters out there who tell you it's all coming back round, and there's a certain energy waves that transmit from mars and uh, makes people think in these cycles And I think when we make music, we're trying to copy people that made music before. So it happens in these steps. So the people who grow up and like us that make music, when that comes their turn, we'll have influenced them. So the creative process and being uh, you know, good enough to be able to do anything creative, you've got to have that germ of an idea way back in the past. So. Mm. But not so every... It's, oh, sorry. It, it's definitely a bit of a... Uh, I guess... Yeah, it's a bit of a... Oh, it's the word I'm looking for. It's like it's like the the anti of what's in the charts, you know. Mm. We don't like that stuff, so this is what we're gonna we're gonna go back to the stuff we really like mm. and kind of stick our middle finger up to that stuff and do it our way. And we've never really tried to compromise on that. And no. fortunately, we've got a record label who let us do what the, what we want really and aren't telling us to make something a bit more <laughs> wobbly or like you know put a bigger kick drum under it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a middle finger up at the, the current music charts, I suppose. And, and what I find interesting about it as well is it, it's obviously it's not every type of music that co comes back around. It's usually these funky uh, types of music, soulful types of music. Yeah. So what does that tell you about those <laughs> records that were made in those times? Well, they were, if we're talking about the sort of production in the 70s, 60s and 70s, it was a totally different ball game, And that's why people sample them because... They were using different analog equipment. They were recording in the room with all the musicians at the same time. They were getting a certain feeling and an energy that people don't don't capture these days. Um, partly because of the equipment they used, partly because all those guys are in the same room together a lot of the time. So that's why we go back and find those moments, those little golden moments that are so hard to recreate because those valve microphones and amplifiers and uh, you know mixing desks aren't in studios these days so very hard to recreate that sound really and they that's all they had they had very basic Both equipment frozen. i froze it you froze i'm still moving i can't see you i, got, I can see everybody oh, okay <laughs> you froze to me roy but um i think as long as the audio is still there um I'm good yeah so it's uh because they didn't have much to work with equipment wise they had to get it right and sounding amazing like Here and then so yeah whereas we know when we get into the studio now we can redo something a million times in in logic or whatever it's no biggie is it difficult then to discern when you should stop tinkering and kind of say okay this song or, or this record this this yeah it should feel done but you can just keep keep going back to it and sometimes having random ideas and spur of the moment things are often the best ones. Um, but you can, the dead hand of rehearsal can, can be all over a project and you can polish something. You can't polish turds, that's what they say, mm. but you can polish something with an inch of its life. And all you're doing is sonically she sheening it up. But if the vibe and idea is not there, then maybe you should go back to the drawing board. Mm. I was quite, I read something. It's like, you should always really try and push for that last 5% to get it and I think we've in the past been guilty of maybe ending it a little bit too soon before that five percent because it does sound pretty done but if you just that very last part like I just remember on this 
album in particular, I'd send stuff back to the guys and be like, let's just get a bit more percussion in that bit or let's, you know, let's get another, I remember doing it with Dynamite MC, let's, let's get another layer of harmonies in that last thing. And that's, that's just so trying to, I really adopted that mentality of trying to push for that last little extra bit that you can get in. And I think that that can kind of make it kind of take a little leap on from the last, the last record, hopefully. Well, what made you do that this time around? What made you focus on kind of the, these details? Well, I just thought, how are we going to progress, really? Like, how how can we up our game just a little bit, you know? Because um, we are we're, we are working with these samples. There's only so much we can do with them to get them sounding good. Um, so that just seemed like an obvious thing, just to try and put a bit more effort into the sort of final final processes. Right. Um, well, there's one song uh, you mentioned, Dynamite MC, and uh, Marietta Smith is on the record. Um, there's also a song, Take Me Back, with uh, Mr. Woodnote, which is an in- more of an instrumental. There, there's some mm-hmm. words and it was mostly instrumental. Um, how does a song like that and a collaboration with, with, uh, with him, how does that come together? Well, he'd been uh, brought into the fold to work on some of the last album to provide horns, and he got brought into the live show as well and okay. provided a uh, great brass section for that. And he wrote some of uh, Steal the Show horn lines and things like that. So it made sense to get him in. He's from a great group called um, Dub FX, who are like sure. international superstars, really. So he was slumming a bit with us, but um, it's great to have on board. And I wanted to create a track that originally I wanted to give to a guy called Remy, who was an Australian rapper, mm. but never made any contact with him. So I thought it'd be nice for Wood well, no, to stretch out and have a song with his name on it. So he... Uh, yeah, it did become such a uh, big part of the band that we wanted to give him a little moment on this album, really, and get his own feature track. And he mm. totally took that one over. Did a beautiful job on it, yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it's the clo- cl- closest we get to just the plaintive jazz. And the rest of the album is quite uppity. And it's got a lot of mad energy, so it's just nice to have that um, moment of calm and quiet, kind of influenced by some of the more instrumental parts on Balloon Mind State, De La Soul's fourth mm, album, okay. uh, with Maceo Parker doing a track that was um, just haunting alto sax, I think, and the sound of children playing in the background, like a window had been left open on a summer's day. And so I put, put a little bit of children playing in the background on the song as well, just as a nod to that one. Okay. And it, uh, well, as you mentioned, is that then uh, one of those songs where it's more uh, more um, you playing as well? Because you mentioned the kind of the jazzy feel. Is it more you playing those chords? And Well, I found the chord sample progression to move them around a bit but there's only a limited amount of things I can do with that. So Andy Cooper um, found the style and tone and created bridge moments with uh, chord progressions he plays on a keyboard. So that added that. Then I just went to town with some kind of Afro-ish percussion. I just really wanted to, to have a lot of energy, but not a lot of tempo. So it was sprightly, but not driving too hard, mm. allowing uh, Woodnote to be able to stretch out a bit on it and have his moments. And then just a nice little vocal sample to tie it together every now and again and give right. it a title as well. And well, something that just popped into uh, to my head, but uh, how, how much of what you guys do is dependent on mood in a way, in, the, in terms of when you're in the studio? But like you mentioned, all those little things you can do, maybe like the children laughing in the background, all those little mm-hmm. things you, to create a certain mood. How much, how important? Yeah, it has to be inspired, really. So if you sit down just looking at a blank screen, nothing's going to come, but you have mm. to go to have that influence, have that moment, have that spark, and then maybe revisit the track a bit later. And you don't know what the last piece of the puzzle is yet, but you might be walking around and hear something coming out of a car or something and go, yeah, a bit like that. Yeah, well, sometimes it's when you're away from the studio doing something else, you'll think mm. of the thing that you need to do to make the track better or something when you step away from it a little bit. So you need that separation every once in a while. Yeah, I think so. How yeah. long has the album? Sorry, how long has the album been uh, finished for you guys? Uh, just um, we finished it pretty much before, around Christmas time, I think. Okay, I so think that's maybe a little, little bit more work. We, I think there was we maybe nine track tracks stuff. done a couple of months before that, and and definitely good a good half of it done pretty much when the last album came out before that. So okay, so so but, okay, but then. Uh, putting that last extra 5% in and finding choice vocalists to work with and then getting in uh, horn players and other players and things like that 
to that stretch the process out and then thinking about an album campaign and thinking about videos and artwork by that point you're starting to add a two-year plus process and the whole thing really right and then obviously live shows uh yeah in the mix and dj commitments (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well because that's that's what would be my follow and because you prepare like that you, you have this whole album concept you, you're preparing for release live shows everything and then yeah, yeah. all of a sudden uh, the world has gone crazy and we, there's nothing <laughs> well luckily we didn't get as far as writing okay. the live okay. show but we this song this album was made definitely to tour that's why there was more of the band brought in and everyone had their moment to shine so it'd be like that'd be a great encore that's how you open the show put it all together we'll get some visuals we'll try and break it all down and dj the bits up and put live playing in when it comes to it but luckily we didn't have to bother doing any of that because uh, (laughs) did you have a nice little break it's half yeah. a, half a relief and half really frustrating <laughs> <laughs> but it does mean when we do hit the road eventually um people will be familiar with the album because if you're touring it straight off the bat, it's kind of like, you might have listened to this on the car on the way here or you might have one song you've heard as a single, but uh, bear with us. You might get to know and love the rest of these. But now mm. hopefully they can blend a bit more into the Allergies Back catalogue when we do eventually take them on the road because people have had maybe a year to uh, get familiar with them. And this, this is maybe a somewhat vague question, but um, what have you noticed about how people react to, to the type of music? This is kind of going back to, to what we talked about earlier, but how do people kind of respond to to these songs? And then especially if, if you look at how they respond to, I don't know if that's true, by the way. I don't know. Uh, uh, go, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been the, the live show in particular is something we started... How long ago was that? A year or two ago. Um, and that's been very explosive. You know, people just get up immediately and start dancing. I, I'm drawn to a certain festival we did called Shindig, uh, Shindig Weekender, which is a big one for all the funk and soul and hip hop heads. And we played the first set on the Sunday. We got there and we thought, oh man, this is going to be tough because these guys have been partying all weekend. It's Sunday morning. When I, you know, midday, Sunday, this is not... Mm. Why did they put us on here? <laughs> Boom! 2,000 yeah. people, first song. Absolutely crazy. And lots of really good feedback about that show. People saying it was a highlight for them. Um, and we did just, you know, got people dancing straight away. In particular, the live show is kind of crafted by Andy Cooper, who obviously did live shows of Ugly Duckling for many, mm. many years and learned a lot. So we've kind of been very fortunate that we've adopted his knowledge what works and how to get people on their feet and, uh, you know, crowd participation back and forth um, and all that stuff. So I think if me and Roy had tried to put a live show together, it would have taken many years (laughs) to figure it out. But fortunately, we've had this knowledge from him. Yeah, He's always had the vision that it's like a live soul review, like a Sam and Dave thing, and there's no breaks between the songs. It's like a mixtape. It just gets faster. Yeah, We keep the party going. There might be a lull, but there's still percussion going, and he'll get the crowd amping up. Crazy. So that's how people have been responding to the live shows. But the album itself and the music, when people take it home and digest it, we found some other very positive responses. People are saying it's getting through, you know, when you always hear people going, get a lot of letters, people saying, it's got me through some hard times. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you do find that. The more you release music with a good vibe and positivity out there, people will get back and kind of say, thank you, I needed that. Especially no, now. It was strangely well-timed, yeah, with the pandemic. A lot of people just saying, this is helping, you know, it's helping mm-hmm. lift my spirits. And the, the first track, Fenley, we released, got, um, you know, heavy playlist on our favourite radio station, Six Music. So, uh feel like that was maybe because it was kind of uplifting a little bit mm. and people needed it so the right time right place kind of thing and also people have been sorry people have been uh, responding to the retro retro style of the music and it, it being very much uh, nodding to certain eras that you don't hear anymore and people saying i'd given up on kind of following new music because i only like mm. stuff from the past and it's super cool that you guys are kind of reinventing that for, for today so people feel like older people feel like they can get back into new music again and start buying records well that's, yeah that's a very interesting uh, that, and like you say it's also kind of that um no i'm i'm looking for the word that the adversarialism against kind of what's what's mainstream now and and mm. how people perceive music these days mm. um so the album say the word when did that title pop up when when did you think that should that has to be the title uh it was just one of the first tracks we finished and i just 
thought, what a great name for the album, say the word. And then like all these images started popping into my head about this monster <laughs> saying, saying, blurting out music out of his mouth and stuff like that. So it was just happened. We, we wanted to come with more of a concept for the art, for the album much earlier on in the process. Cause normally the kind of thing that gets left to the last minute and very rushed you go, Oh, we've got the album. Now we need some artwork. Oh, should we just stick our faces, faces. on the front of it? <laughs> make it look a bit old <laughs> <and> like, <laughs> which is what we did with the first album mm-hmm. um but with this one that that was like one of the first things we did got the artwork um done by a really good uh illustrator in bristol called Loch ness um and that di- i don't know yeah it sort of dictated it from there really yeah having that idea and concept and all the color that was in the artwork mm-hmm. may have reflected on the mood of the album a little bit as well i don't know because and also, also we want. Oh, so I was gonna say we also we want albums to have a very proactive nature mm-hmm. to their name. Steal the show, say the word. There's action to be taken there. Mm-hmm. It always feels like it's leaping off the shelves. Hopefully, and kind of what you mentioned with the mood. Um, ultimately, it's also to to get people's minds off of horrible things, right? It's it's really. Uh, I don't know if escapism is the right right way to describe it, but it's really give, trying to give people a good time, not not reminding them of all the horrors going on in the world, but just giving them a good time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Positivity and mm. uh, good feelings. And that's, yeah, that kind of vibe is something we always want to push. Might have a few reflective moments on there, but it's, it's from the heart and positivity. Just want the toe tapping, really. And like Adam said about coming from a place of big DJs, there's always, you need the heads not in the foots, foots tapping, so. Last question then. Um, when uh, live shows are possible again, what is that, I don't know how much you, you have the ability to go to live shows yourself because you're playing, but um, what, what would be the first live show you would want to see when it's possible again? Hmm. Um, in terms of like musicians, I'd like to see, I don't know. I was going to try and I'm into sort of like this kind of modern soul and jazz resurgence that's happening in London at the moment and across the world with like mm-hmm. a guy called Tom Meesh and Loyal Carno and these kind of cats. Um, so yeah, I was, I was looking forward to catching those guys. Michael Kiwanuka as well. These two was going to be on tour and then that all got cancelled. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, obvious stuff like we'd normally had Della Soul tickets and, you know, all that stuff as well. Well, uh, hopefully in the, in the near future, right? I hope so, man. I mean, I just, <laughs> it's all so up in the air. I really can't see a way out of it for quite a long time, really, which is quite and sad. I, know, I read that, uh, I don't know if it was, it was America or somewhere else, but they said that they could find a cure maybe not until January of 2021, which would mean that all of kind of big performances are already scrapped for the rest of the year which which yeah i mean i'm i'm yeah i'm just looking way past that really i think that's okay. quite quite unrealistic to get a, a valid vaccine that quickly i'm a son exactly. of a scientist who works for a pharmaceutical company so <laughs> you see <laughs> Fair he, enough. Know, Fair he, knows, enough. he knows about this stuff and he's sort of yeah you know a normal vaccine takes 10 years to develop so uh <laughs> so we're very much up in the air. I don't see it coming together in six months, really. But yeah, fair um, enough, that makes sense. You know, I think you've I got the know. guitar there, so we'll just have our own little festival with the three of us, I think. <laughs> we're going to have to find a way around it, or, you know, socially distance events just sound awful to me, but maybe we're just going to have to get around our heads around that idea of having less people in clubs and certain areas. I don't yeah. know. Have you had the ability, uh, any ability to play from uh, people either through live stream or anything? Did, uh, have you done that so far? Yeah, yeah. We've been uh, doing a thing called webcam jams, which is where we kind of pretty much this scene you see behind us. We uh, this little camera set up and get the decks out and play seven inch records and put an hour live DJ set together every week, which you can see on Twitch and uh, on Facebook before they mute it. So we've been doing that really and getting the call up to play various online festivals is pretty much doing the same thing and um adam you're saying about the lockdown videos we've been doing as well um yeah it's just been a a learning new learning curve how Mm. to get ourselves online and figure out all the tech of how to record and stuff and broadcast um it's very different (laughs) (laughs) we've been getting the band together but um (laughs) but yeah we've been like getting the band together for uh 
lockdown videos we call them yeah. uh, which uh, they've been quite effective and quite successful actually you know even just stuff like we're not really able to make proper music videos mm. get a whole mm. film crew in a cast in the same space together it's, yeah, everything's sure. tricky at the moment sure. Um, sure. So, there was yeah. there was a plan to do was it the second single off the album uh, called let them know features the cuban brothers say we're gonna go to Havana and join the back of an actual Mardi Gras style festival okay. and like film the video for that. And we would either go down or shoot some bits from the sunshine parts of Bristol. So th- that would have been a great video, but it only exists on storyboards and imagination. And, and we, just keep that dream alive and maybe in a year yeah. you can still do it. Yeah. We do have another lockdown video coming. Uh, it's going to be for the single. I'm on it with Skunkadelic and uh, Dr. Syntax and us DJ in the background. We're kind of, people do their bits in their own houses and Adam stitches them together in video form and we get our design guy, Mark Cursor, to prettify it all up. So that should be a little bit of promo content coming. If people can't come and see us, they can do it from comfort of their own home. (laughs) Sounds good. All right, guys. (laughs) Thank you very much for your time. Real pleasure, man.